via Telephone Financial, Phil himself. Good morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Great, man. How about yourself? I'm in the dream. Well, Phil, as a former Shepherd football player yourself, uh, four Shepherd Rams signed undrafted free agent contracts right after the draft concluded and are currently entitled to go into their NFL buildings with four different franchises. That's a little bit new, isn't it? It is, and it's exciting, too. I mean, to have four of them, we had all forgotten about the tight end, and forgive me, I can't remember their name. Brian Walker. Walker. We'd yeah. all forgotten about the tight end, but, man, it just kind of shows the talent that's coming out of Shepard. I think some people were a little disappointed that none of them were drafted, but at the end of the day, they're in camp, man, and it, and, and it doesn't matter from there whether you're a fifth, sixth, seventh round pick, undrafted friend, it doesn't matter. You have the same chances that everybody else has. So I'm, I'm excited for all of them, and I, I think and I hope that they'll all do well. Yeah. Phil, I was at a uh, function at Shepherd University uh, last Saturday night, and uh, this was a fairly formal function, uh, Emil and like. And every time a report came in about one of the Shepherd's uh, players, uh, the – the uh, the um, schedule of the evening was totally changed. The program was interrupted. Everybody would st- hop around on the iPhone very quickly and be a loud cheer if, when uh, Bajan announced, uh, Fisher announced all of them. It was a, an exciting time in, at, at the Shepherd University. Very nice. Yeah, and it should be, man, because it's, I mean, they're, and that should help recruiting too. I don't know, and I don't keep track of all Division two schools, and I know that there were some Division two athletes that got drafted but how many division two schools had four that signed uh signed some sort of contract so it's it's a big big time you know we've had shepherds had pro uh pro players before you know i'm thinking back to the uh, my the old school days but you had wayne wilson and james roots who we kind of forget about i remember he, he had yes he had quite a stay in the nfl you know he hopped around some but he kind of followed herm edwards everywhere he went and Ended up coaching for a bit with the Ravens, boo, but uh, but he did have uh, he did he had a pretty decent career, and then over in NFL Europe, and then here recently with the big receiver uh, Brown, and then the defensive back. So they've had a lot of success in the pros, and that should be great. I would imagine that would be great for recruiting. How many Division two programs, especially around here, can say what Shepherd can say? Very nice uh, moment for those four and for the program in general. And uh, for our Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, Phil, you had to be happy with that draft. I was happy with that draft. And, and now I have, to, I have to cushion this and have to admit that every time I like or dislike a draft drafted player, it, I prove out to be 100% <laughs> wrong. So I, I don't want to jinx them. But I remember how excited I was over Jarvis Jones how excited I was over Artie Burns Ooh. and how mad I was about Big Ben. I'm just going to leave that laying right there. It goes to show my talent evaluation isn't up to par. But I was really happy with the positions that they picked, the value that they seem to get, and how cool is it that Joey Porter Jr. is is, is on the Steelers and you got all those pictures with him with his dad at the Super Bowl and so forth. So I, I, I like the size that they got, and it appears to me anyway – that they're getting back to some bully football. And that's kind of what we like as Steeler fans, where everybody that they had drafted big, physical, mean, tough type of players. And, and that's, that's the kind of players we need on, on the Pittsburgh Steelers. I'm excited for next season. Well, Phil, sure. let's hope you're better at analyzing the financial world than the draft. <laughs> I am. I get paid for that. <laughs> so let's, let's get into that now. Of, uh, of the big tech companies, Apple is still to report uh, this Thursday of this week and uh, we're watching a bunch of other stuff too so what do you got on your plate today well of course we have apple and i think that is thursday don't hold me it is they get them do some but i see yeah, apple is thursday of course i think that's the biggest company by far reporting this week and we had the federal reserves announcement on what they're going to do with interest rates it's still important but it's nowhere near as important or could cause the volatility that it has over the past year simply because of the size of the expected rate increase. Now, one way that it could be, one way that it could cause a major market damage is if they were to come out and say half a percent increase or the tone afterwards. And we have to pay attention. Tyler kind of, he, he, he kind of taught me that because he's always paying, he's always listening to Jerome Powell after the rate announcement. And we tend to get the rate announcement and our markets react one way and then he starts to talk. 
And one thing that he says or even the verbiage or the tone in which he says it can cause us to completely flip around. So I think most importantly this week, assuming they do a quarter of a percent, and honestly, I don't know if it's a quarter of a percent or no rate increase at all, if it would mean anything to our markets, quite honestly, I think it has to do with the path. What are we going to do? What do we think we're going to do moving forward? And we will be data-driven as we have been in the past. So the CPI, the PPI, and the PCE, and all these inflation reports that come on a monthly basis will probably be more important this time than what the actual rate increase is. We're pretty solid. We're pretty firm. I think it's baked into an extent of a quarter of a percent or maybe even no increase at all. But remember that that's a far cry from three-quarters of a percent and half a percent that we were dealing with last year. It's just a quarter of a percent, and that's more normal as far as the Federal Reserve actions go. As In the past, we've had a quarter of a percent increases every quarter, a quarter per quarter. I remember saying that in 2018, a quarter per quarter. And, and now that looks like we've, we've been there, done that, and we have something to relate it to. So I don't, I don't know that it's as it could cause the volatility that it has in the past, but it is still probably the most important thing that's going to happen this week. To date, this is through the month of April, the Dow is plus 2%, the S&P plus 8%, and the NASDAQ plus 16%. Uh, for the year, Phil. So clearly the market is recovering from the initial shock of the interest rate hikes and such. It's on its pace. It's on path to recovery. We haven't recovered everything yet, but take that back a little bit further to October 1st of 2022, and that's kind of when our recovery, if this is a recovery, that's when it began is October 1st of 2022. So now we're looking at, and, and you can compare our market movements with the Federal Reserve's actions and tones from October moving forward. We've seen some, we've seen inflation abate a little bit, not all the way. There's still that sticky inflation that we're going to argue and debate why it's there and what we got to do to stop it. And, and even if it's a bad thing, you have a lot of people that say, hey, this sticky inflation, which is uh, wage inflation and a strong, stronger than expected jobs market, well, let's let that remain, and let's move our target from 2% inflation to 3% inflation, and let's just let that be because it's not a bad thing. So there are, there are some people that are, are screaming for that while the Federal Reserve is maintaining this 2% number. Eventually, they may come off of that. But go back. If you're looking at your portfolios, go back to October 1st of 2022. If you're trying to put, and this is the old Southern West Virginia term, put some lipstick on that pig, the pig being 2022 as a whole, but October 1st moving forward, we've had we've had a pretty good run. There's been some stalls and there's been some step backs, which is normal. But October 1st moving forward until today, it's been a pretty good period. We will get this week, Phil, reports on construction spending, factory orders, jobless claims, and the April jobs report. Will all that influence what the Fed does next? I would think, or, or at least uh, partly, it would bake into the equation, especially the job front. And, and, of course, this is a hotly debated topic, but the jobs. You know, on one hand, you say, well, we want jobs and we want wages to be increased, and we think that's a he- part of a healthy economy. But on the other hand, it's an inflationary pressure, and that is the sticky inflation that we talk about because we're still paying people way more than what we did three years ago. And, and when I talk about paying people, I'm talking about entry-level and exit-level positions. Now, at what's an exit-level position? It's someone that is at or near retirement or even in retirement that are transitioning or those retirees. And those people seem to have gone away after COVID. You don't see as much of that as what you did pre-COVID. And there's a lot of reasons for it. I don't really know the exact reason, but, of course, you know, I don't want to wear a mask or I don't want to keep up with this technology or is it really worth it? And the portfolio values that we had is something we don't talk a lot about. But why did we have a, a, a mass exodus of, of workers that were near at near or in retirement? Why did we have that? And it was because portfolio values had done so well in 2020 and 2021 that they had more confidence. And so look, my, my nest egg is much larger than what it was before, coupled with I don't know that I really want to deal with what I have to deal with now to, to work in this new environment. 
so I'm out. And that was one of the first issues that we had was a lack of willing workers because some of those at, near, or in retirement workers are no longer working or were no longer working. And on top of that, you know, you had to enhance extended unemployment benefits. So the competition for the entry-level positions wasn't another business. It was the government. I got to pay them more than what they can make staying home. All the while, their kids are home from school, or and they, they have to find a, a solution for that because schools aren't open. So then you saw wages skyrocket, and we're still coming down off of that in a vacuum. It's really good. You may be sitting there thinking, "Yeah, I used to make ten bucks an hour. Now I'm making twenty bucks an hour." Phil, shut up. This is this is something that's good, and it is good in a vacuum. But for inflation, when we're talking about inflation, we have our our blinders on for the stock market. It's not good, and and that's kind of what they're busting through. So the jobs report, the jobs numbers that we get this week, is a huge part of the equation for what the Federal Reserve will do. Uh, Phil. Uh Often on the show, we talk about what may happen uh, in the next three or four months. Let me project down what may happen in the next five, six, seven years. The EVs, uh, uh, electrical vehicles, are going to be here to stay. There's an article recently in one of the national newspapers that said uh, that they need a lot of manganese, uh, lithium, cobalt, and these products are not really available currently in the U.S., but the U.S. needs to ha- uh, will have plans of trying to mine and refine these resources. There's also an article recently about uh, University of West Virginia, West Virginia University, uh, it's looking at pressure precious metals, recovering precious metals from our, the old mine shafts, the, uh, the mine sp- uh, uh, waste. Uh, are, are you looking at down the line of how we, how we could address these needs uh, as we change in a different way of living, such as le- electrical vehicles? Not from a portfolio of construction, I'm not. And, and simply because when we construct a portfolio, we're looking at sector-specific uh, exchange-traded funds or mutual funds or separately managed accounts that are picking out the, the, best, uh, the best companies for a sector that we want to invest in. So we leave that to the guys that are setting their crunching numbers and looking at profit and loss uh, margins. You know, from a financial planner standpoint, we rely upon them to say, and that's going to fit into the energy sector uh, for the most part, when we say, hey, we want to invest in energy, we don't really care if it's coal, if it's natural gas, if it's batteries, if it's lithium, whatever it may be, whatever is going to be profitable is what we want to fill that piece of the pie for the energy sector. So we, we wouldn't, I wouldn't debate that, of course, EVs are here to stay and how long will it take, and there's a lot of hurdles that they have to create, but you can even see it with General Motors and Ford and some of the American automakers, not just Tesla, but all the automakers are starting to pivot toward having some exposure to 100% EV vehicles. And, of course, they'll have to make them more affordable at some point in the infrastructure around rural areas like what we have here uh, to be able to charge them and, and to live that way instead of putting gas in and now have to charge it. So there's all those all those, all that criteria that they have to, that they have the hurdles that they have to meet. But we do look at it from that standpoint. And as we go along and we, we, um, kind of gauge our portfolios and how a portfolio manager is doing, if we were to look at something now or in the future and say, man, they completely ignore some of this technology, we would move off of that. We would say, let's, you know, we, we don't want to go all into it right now but we would want to move off of them because they're a little bit too old school. So we're, we're measuring the portfolio managers instead of the sectors or the specific companies that would profit from that. So a survey recently by one of the car features that we do said to, to this point, still most, the vast majority of Americans are not interested in EVs right now. John Gilstrap. Hey, Phil, I'm curious. Um, Anheuser-Busch got spanked pretty hard in the last couple of weeks uh, their Bud Light brand certainly took a hit uh, because of political positions and I know staying politically agnostic on this thing not taking a position one way or the other do you think that 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 lesson will be translated be accepted into the various corporate boards to stay in their lane as an investor if I if I invest in a company that seems sound for all the reasons that you want to invest 
And then they go out on a limb and and take a political stance, one side or the other in a divided country, you're going to anger 50 percent of of the other side. Do you think we're reaching a point where um, they're going to stop doing that, stay in their lane and just make stuff? Uh, Maybe at some point as it angers a lot of people. But I think we should look at Anheuser-Busch stock. And I don't remember exactly when those commercials were that made so many people angry. But over the past month, Anheuser-Busch's stock, and it falls on the Dow, I believe. Don't hold me to that. But Anheuser-Busch's stock is up 2.36%, which was surprising to me. And along in there, they also had a dividend. They paid a dividend. So when we look at, hey, here's what they're telling us with sales, and they haven't sold as much of their beer or so forth and so on, which I don't debate at all, their stock price has not struggled because of that. Their stock price has kind of done what it always does. And, you know, from a from a one year, a year to date, it's up 8.2 percent in a rolling one year. And it just kind of surprised me when I looked at it from a rolling one year. That means going back to this date last year. So May of last year, it is up. It's positive 12 percent. So in the long term, I don't know that it has hurt their stock price as much as what so many people had thought that it would hurt their stock price. And we do tend to, that they those do tend to be short-term, and I'll use Nike as an example, short-term issues that consumers will eventually forget about if they like that product. You, know, you had the Colin Kaepernick commercials, if everybody remembers that, mm-hmm. it made everybody mad that he, he does all this stuff, he kneels for a flag, and it touched the it touched the emotion for everybody, whether you agreed with what he did or you didn't, someone, everyone, had an opinion on that and then nike puts his face like uh, he was the face of nike for a bit and i thought to myself i was like oh boy that's the end of nike you had the beginning of them with that with michael jordan in the 80s and now this may be the end of nike and it really didn't seem to matter we seem to get over that fairly quickly and i wonder if it's not going to be the same thing with anheuser bush that consumers tend to get over that fairly quickly if they have one or two more commercials with big horses and we forget about what angered us with that commercial and and even those that had maybe come to we have to remember this as well so they took that that very controversial stance with the commercial and we did have it you could see it you could go on facebook and look so many people that left the brand but how many people did it bring into the brand? That I don't know because I haven't seen anything about that. But their stock price does not reflect what we're seeing in the media and what they're telling us has happened with their sales. Their stock price doesn't reflect it right now. Anheuser-Busch at $64.97. It's 52-week high, $60 and $67.09, Phil. So it's $2.12 below its one-year high. So any residual effects of the moment of rage really haven't affected the price at all uh the nike not yet and yeah, maybe uh, it will in its earnings maybe uh, well that's earnings. that's the part you, the news follows the earnings right uh the nike thing was interesting because i think the people that were angered by the colin kaepernick thing weren't the people who were buying nike stuff anyway it wasn't you know the angered market wasn't the same as the market they were serving and the market they were serving it it helped it it, uh, it bought more stuff it drove the price up so you know who's angered uh, also has to coincide with uh, who buys the product for it to affect, I think, the, the actual attitude that the company has as to whether they're afraid to do something one way or the other. That's my dissertation for my master's. Uh, Rob's rant. Yeah. 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 I, I, yeah, that wasn't really a rant. No, no not really. Yeah. But we've missed your rant, Rob. Oh, just we, mention yeah. Hillary Clinton. Yeah. I'll, I'll be right back there. Uh, <laughs> but, Aunt Jill, Phil, how do we reach you for more information today, sir? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. You can catch Financial Phil each weekday morning at 638, replayed at 738 for a two-minute capsule on what's happening with the markets uh, that day.